Okay, so tonight we are going to begin with some bone tissue. So we've made it through our first physiological system, which was the integumentary system, and now we're going to move on to the second physiological system, which is the skeletal system. And that's um, going to include bone and cartilage and ligaments, and we're going to start out with what's going on with the bone. So skeletal system, again, three major components. Including the bones themselves, which each individual bone, 260 in the human body, would be classified as an organ of the organ system known as the skeletal system. We also have cartilage. which is more of a tissue, and then we have ligaments, which are going to connect bone to bone. Now, the skeleton itself is a living framework. And this living framework is going to give us the ability to hang the rest of anatomy. And when I say living framework uh, and hang the rest of anatomy, I mean both literally, we have tissues that hang off of the bones, and also sort of figuratively the bone, I mean, I'm sorry, the skeleton and the really the names of the bones in a lot of cases become a starting place as we work through additional organ systems uh, from a naming, naming convention. So let me give you an example. What's the bone at the very um, front of my head? So that's the frontal bone. This would be the frontal area for one of our body areas. We also have a skeleton muscle there that helps us to wrinkle up our forehead. It's called frontalis. So we can literally use the bones to build up other anatomical features or be able to name other anatomical features. So it becomes a living framework that we can both literally and figuratively hang other anatomy off of. The skeletal system provides humans with six main functions. Function number one is support, and this provides muscle attachment, and girdled support for the limbs, the upper and lower limbs, and then also houses the teeth. So we have muscle attachment, and we girdle a lot of the other organs and organ systems off of the skeleton, and we can uh, you know, have places for our teeth to be housed, such as the sockets in our, in our mandible and our maxilla. <clears throat> Skeletal system is also going to provide protection. So much of our body is going to be enclosed within some portion of the skeletal system. We have the thoracic cavity protected by the rib cage. We have the spine and the, and the brain protected by the cerebral and the spinal uh, cavities, each of them encased in bones. So the protection is um, protecting visceral organs or important organs. So if you get punched in the chest, it's not going to collapse your lung because you have the rib cage protecting those visceral organs. Third main function is movement. And movement comes um, 
uh, with the aid of muscles. So really the, the skeletal system provides joints and, and basically places of rotation for that movement and it's facilitated to the, through the action through the action of the uh, through the action of the skeletal muscle. Uh, and this movements can include both involuntary processes and then also voluntary motion. So every time you breathe, that's an involuntary process for the most part. There's sometimes you can think about it, but for the most part, it's subconscious. You're not really thinking about it. And your lungs are going to be expanded by the motion of your ribcage as the muscles pull on the, on the ribs. Or this could include voluntary motion, such as me walking across the room as I lecture. So involuntary process and vo involuntary motion? Yeah, we could call them involuntary processes are going to be facilitated by the skeletal, skeletal system. And then voluntary mo motion or voluntary movement is also facilitated by the skeletal system. Skeletal system is also going to provide electrolyte balance. The bones are really good sites of storage. So they are storage tissues for calcium and for phosphate. Oh, I got my numbers backwards there. PO4 three minus. Okay, so um, calcium and phosphate are going to be stored up in the bone, and when they, if we need calcium, which at times we need calcium, we can call it out of the bone, out of storage. Skeletal system and the bones in particular are also going to be uh, involved in acid-base balance. Regulating tissue and fluid pH. Bones can absorb and release when necessary alkaline phosphatase. Um, I'm sorry, not alkaline phosphatase, alkaline phosphate through the action of alkaline phosphatase. And carbonate salts. Okay, so we can actually increase and decrease pH by absorbing or releasing these chemicals. And then the last of the six functions here is going to be blood formation. In that blood formation, we have red marrow that's present, red bone marrow. And this is the site for production of red blood cells. Produces red blood cells. Okay, so that's just sort of a brief introduction to this kind of get us moving here in the right direction. Uh, now let's specifically look at bone tissue itself. So here is an image of bone tissue. Uh, you've got the microgram here, which you've actually all seen that before in histology. And then you have a cartoon blow up here of what that tissue may actually look like with a small little section here showing and illustrating different lamellae, lacunae, and cannuliculi, just a small piece of an osteum. So when we refer to bone itself, bone is an organ, and that means it's many different types, or several types of tissue that come together to provide the purpose of that particular organ. So bones, when we think of the femur or the humerus or the radius, those are bones, and they are comprised of various 
tissues. So we have osseous tissue, nervous tissue, circulatory tissue, all making up various aspects of these organs that are called bones. What I really want to talk about is osseous tissue. So I want to get down to the level of the tissue and discuss this osseous tissue. Now, osseous tissue is one of the types of tissue that we find in a bone. This is sort of the hallmark tissue for the organ. It is a connective tissue And the uh, connective tissue, the, the matrix, has a low amount of water or a high amount of solids. So this tissue known as osseous tissue, it's a connective tissue. In the matrix, remember that's our extracellular fluid that surrounds the cells, it's a lower water concentration and a higher solid concentration. So osseous tissue, the matrix, is mostly going to be calcified. Okay, so there's going to be a, a high rate of calcification maintained in the bones. And that calcification comes through the addition of calcium phosphate. Calcium phosphate. Uh, you can also call this mineralization, and this adds the solidness, adds to the solidness, or what I'm going to now refer to as hardness. You're all very aware that your bones are pretty hard, and it's because of this calcification process. So we'll come back and we'll talk more about everything that you're seeing here and kind of give you a better look at that shortly. But before we do that, I, I want to continue along on what the bone would look like without this calcification process. So uh, keep this term in mind. That says composite material. Anyone familiar with the composite material? Have you heard of that term before? Have any of you gone fishing? Only one of you has ever fished before? Okay, so many of you have gone fishing and you used a fishing pole or a fishing rod. And a fishing rod is a composite material. If you look at the rod itself, typically they're made up of some sort of fibrous material, such as carbon fiber or graphite. And then they get hardened with a solution or with a material called epoxy. And so we have the hardness of the epoxy which is one of our materials, with the flexibility of the fibers, graphite or carbon fiber. And when they get put together on their own, graphite or carbon fiber is flexible, epoxy, epoxy is very hard. You put them together, you get a material that is both hard and flexible. So this is actually an engineering term that basically just means that by putting two materials together, we can get the best of both of those materials very common through a lot of different materials that are made. Uh, we have hard cars that are <coughs> rigid, yet they are flexible from the materials that we put in, which is a good thing if you get into a car accident or a crash. So the bone is also a natural occurring composite. So this you'll recognize as just being a bone. This is actually, um, well, I guess that's probably the fibula. So the small bone in the leg. And it's a composite of soft tissue, or what we would call spongy tissue, which makes the bone flexible, and this hardened calcification um, material, calcium phosphate, that makes the bone hard. Now, the spongy tissue is, um, in a lot of ways, is, is a high concentration of collagen. So that's what you're seeing here is, here is our strong yet flexible bone, so it can carry my weight, but if I jump up and down, my legs are not just going to break. They can actually accommodate the, the, the force of the jump. But if I take the mineral out, and so I'm just left over with the collagen, I'd be able to exhibit that real flexible nature. And that's what they're showing you there, is they can tie that bone almost into a knot. 
On the other side, if I get rid of that soft tissue and I'm just left over with the calcification, it's very, very strong, but it becomes very, very brittle. This obviously won't hold your weight. This obviously would break all of the time. But you put them together and you get a structure, a composite material that is strong and flexible. Okay, there are four types of bones, and this again is talking at the level of the organ that we call a bone. Those four types of bones, you can see examples of each in this picture. So our flat bones, these typically can be classified as also protective <laughs> bones. So these are bones that are, we're going to find surrounding something. The skull surrounds the brain. The sternum and the ribs surround the lungs. The pelvis surrounds the reproductive and urinary organs. And those are all examples of flat bones. Our long bones, these can also be classified as movement bones. And so these will facilitate both voluntary and involuntary movement. And so they include the legs, or the, the bones of the leg, femur, tibula, and fibula, and the bones of the upper limb, the so ulna, radius, and humerus. These are all examples of long bones. They help to facilitate moving, walking, throwing a ball, and kicking a ball, and things like that. The short bones are going to facilitate movement as well, but they are going to be limited movement. So limited movement bones. And these are going to include things like the carpals and the tarsals, which are the bones of the hands and the feet, and then also the patella, which is the bone there in the knee. Those are examples of short bones. And they don't have as much movement as my long bones, but they still provide a, a, a small amount of movement to facilitate uh, the ability to work and things like that. And then the last category uh, is, I don't know, I guess we got really lazy here as biologists at some point. They're called irregular bones, and an irregular bone is nothing more than a bone that's not a long bone, a short bone, or a flat bone. It's just sort of a catch-all of everything else. So these are bones that do not fit the other categories. Okay, so bones that do not fit the other categories or don't fit elsewhere. And in all reality, they are pretty irregular in shape. You can see this is the sphenoid bone, one of our cranial bones, and it's got a really bizarre shape. The ethmoid bone and the vertebrae are also pretty weird shaped. So just sort of a catch-all. Um, some of these are bones that help out with protection, such as the sphenoid and the, ver and the vertebrae, which covers the uh, spinal column. Uh, ethmoid is sort of a protective bone as well. Um, but then there are some irregularly shaped bones that facilitate some, uh, some other processes, movement, or, uh, um, um, or uh, other types of activities. We have a bone right here. This is the CSI bone. <laughs> its name is technically the hyoid, and you probably have all run into the hyoid. And you probably, if you ever watch CSI or one of those criminal shows, you've heard um, people say, oh, well, we found a crack in the, in the hyoid or a, lic a ligature in the hyoid, and so we know that that individual was strangled. So the hyoid bone, in all reality, it helps with some uh, function in the neck and in, um, in the lower part of the face, um, but I think also part of it is so that we know that the individual will strangle like God created. <laughs> so I guess you don't really, in those terms, want to use your hyoid bone.
Now, I'd like to take a look at both the long bones and the flat bones from an anatomical perspective. The irregular bones are so irregular, there's not really any unifying anatomy that we can that we can really point to. So the sphenoid bone, I, you know, we have the, the lesser and the greater wings of the sphenoid bone. I go to the ethmoid bone, which is another irregular bone, and I can be like, oh yeah, there's the lesser wing and there's the greater wing. There's not really anything that unifies them. And then the short bones, um, I mean, basically they are all very much almost like a cube shape, to be perfectly honest. Um, so there's not a lot we can talk about there. But the long bones and the flat bones have some pretty unique unifying anatomy that we need to be able to identify. So let's start out with the long bones. And we'll hit on long bone anatomy. So here's a cross section through the top of the bone and then a reflection of this outer layer called the periosteum and then whole bone throughout the rest of the length. So starting with that outer layer that they've peeled back here in this image, all long bones are going to be lined by periosteum. <clears throat> periosteum. Uh, and this really is a covering over the bone, and in particular, a part of bone known as compact bone. And if you look at this bone here, you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see it real well, but the, the edge of the bone here, it's very prominent here in the shaft of the bone. It's very um, solid looking, and we call that compact bone. And then up here towards the ends, and then right here in the middle, you can see that it is, I guess, more holy, not H-O-L-Y, W-H-O-L-L-Y. Um, it looks more like a sponge, and that's what we call spongy bone. And the periosteum is going to be associated with that compact bone on the exterior of, uh, of the bone. We're also going to have an endosteum, which is actually going to be a very similar connective tissue like periosteum, but that's associated on the inside and will actually interact with the spongy bone more prolifically. So suffice it to say, periosteum covers the whole bone. And then we have two ends. We have an upper end and a lower end. I'm just going to simply uh, refer to those. Uh, hold on. Before I go there, I kind of jumped ahead of myself. Um, let's, let's make sure we get this in our notes. So on the inside, <clears throat> the compact bone, this should be a plus sign or an and sign, and the spongy bone are going to be covered by endosteum. So periosteum on the outside, endosteum on the inside. At the ends, the ends, as you can see, have this pretty interesting name. One will be labeled distal, one will be labeled proximal, and that's pronounced epiphysis. So the ends of the bones are the epiphyses, uh, individually the epiphysis. And these, in the long bones, provide joint surfaces. The joint surfaces are going to be covered in the living individual with articular cartilage. So articular cartilage. And typically it's the type of cartilage called hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage. Now, on the inside, which you can see your articular surface here, these uh, condyle would be covered up with hyaline cartilage. And then if we were to take a cross-section through that bone, the inside of the bone 
is going to have spongy bone. that contains a type of bone marrow called red bone marrow. So within all of these little tiny holes here in the epiphysis, we'll have this tissue type called red marrow. Now, in that cross section, and you can see two locations on here, there would also be one location down here, there appears to be a line that is <coughs> hardened compact tissue. Doesn't look like compact bone. I mean, sorry, it doesn't look like spongy bone. It looks more like compact bone. In that area, is called the epiphyseal line. And in the adult, the epiphyseal line is actually the remnant of what's known as the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate, which is where the bone, the long bone, is going to elongate. Now, in the adult, it actually does become hardened tissue, and that's what stops growth. It seals the growth plate, uh, but we still see the remnant of that epiphyseal line. Okay? So those are just the ends of the bones. Lots of stuff going on in the ends of the bones. The middle of the bone that you can see here, uh, you may refer that to that as the bone shaft. Properly, you should refer to it as the diaphysis. Okay, so this is the shaft or the diaphysis. I'm sorry. No, I didn't. <laughs> it's all right. All right, so the diaphysis, you can see here that the spongy bone gives away, and we actually form an opening, an open space or a cavity. And that cavity is actually going to be containing, it's actually going to contain a type of marrow called yellow marrow. So the diaphysis in cross section or in longitudinal section like we have here contains the marrow cavity and that marrow cavity is going to be filled with yellow marrow. Now, as you can see here, we have some blood supply that comes into each of our long bones. And we need to provide those vessels with an opening to enter into the bone. And so you can look at the uh, diaphysis of any given long bone, and you should be able to identify a small hole through, through the tissue, a small hole through the bone. Someone name that bone mark. So it's... A, yeah, so it's a foramen. It's the, the small little tiny hole that allows vessels to cross into the into the uh, um, into the diaphysis or into the bone is going to be called a foramen. And technically, it's a nutrient foramen because that's where we're getting our nutrient and supply. What is the foramina? The foramina is, the is just foramen? a really, 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 really small foramen. A for, foramen is a is a Large, larger hole, a foramina, is a really, really tiny hole. So, um, foramen typically allow blood supply, the passage of vessels. So that's why you have things like the uh, the jugular foramen. Okay, uh, magnum foramen is going to be the spinal cord passing through the base of the skull. Uh, one of the most, um, I guess, uh, obvious foramina to me um, is the uh, the crib reform foramina, and that's where the, sensi the, the uh, sensory ends of cranial nerve number two, uh, cranial nerve number two, which is olfactory, those are the, sen the, sen the nerve sensory, the sensory endings of that nerve that cross through at a variety of different points. By the way, that's also the reason for the ice cream. Is those little tiny nerves take something very, very cold and it causes an increase in blood supply. I'm totally getting off track here. It causes an increase in blood supply around those nerves and the pressure on those nerves sends back a pain signal to the brain. I just love ice cream so much. 
you can get free ice cream at the bakery today. Free ice cream. Free ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Class dismissed. <laughs> what do you have to do to get free ice cream at night? Nothing. 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 Uh, for the most part, it's actually just one supply. And that's not very uncommon with organs, right? We'll see the kidneys have a renal artery and a renal vein. So these are basically organs. We have one vein in, or one vessel in, one vessel back. Out. All right, let's take a look at flat bones. Okay, so um, you're basically seeing three different pictures. This would be a small chunk of flat bone. This would be what the flat bone looks like on the inside. And then, as you can see right here, this is an osteum that makes up these things that are known as trabeculae. So uh, at the onset, that <coughs> main picture here, you have it's a bone sandwich, right? Everybody see the bone sandwich? You have this compact bone on either side and then spongy bone inside. Now the sandwich, again, uh, so we would call it compact. And then intervening is going to be the spongy bone. Which is also often referred to as the diplo. So compact, spongy, or diplo and then compact. Bread, jelly, bread. Now the diplo or the spongy bone is going to be the site for marrow or marrow in these flat bones. And it's not, I mean, this is a really big target, right? Um, and so a lot of times the flat bones are what are going to be targeted for bone marrow capture. Sternum, you might get bone marrow uh, donation from the sternum or from the hip. Um, they could do the skull and that would be stupid. Though. If they can get enough from the hip and the sternum. You can actually hit it on the hip and get into that epiphysis. But that's, I mean, that's a different bird ball game. This, I mean, this is right on the surface. The, the hip joint's pretty deep inside of a lot of muscular tissue. The sternum's not that far away. I mean, it's going to hurt like crazy, but it's easier to get in there. And that's par partially because of that anatomical structure. <laughs> it's usually from the sternum or from the, from the pelvis. All right, so what are these trabeculae? And you can see that they're basically these little tiny beams that make up the, uh, the spongy bone. Uh, so the trabeculae are going to be those thin layers of tissue. So a thin layer of tissue form the spongy bone structure. Form the spongy bone structure. Now, this is an osteon, right? And you all should recognize that as an osteon. And you can see that one osteon per trabeculae. But as we go to compact bone, we're going to begin to pack osteon alongside of osteon to form the more compact bone. So now you can begin to see those anatomical reasons here for compact bone versus spongy bone. Now here as well, just like with our long bone, we're going to have periosteum. 
on the outside, so along this surface here, and then along the um, well, along the outer surface here, and then along the inner surface of those guys, and then uh, of that compact bone there, we're going to have endosteal. So you have compact bones and stuff that are compact bones. So when does that make it like almost impossible for them to move? Almost impossible for it to move. Like um, what's the point of those things at all? Is the way I just put compact bones on it? Because you need places to you need places to make red red blood cells. And this is one of our sites of red blood cell production. But any bone that has that is not gonna move basically in the brain. <laughs> what, what do you mean by move? Okay, so like you said, we jump and then you need the like, you see what I'm saying? Let me form this bottom real quick. So are you saying that why do we have, why is this a composite? If we, yes. Wonderful. Yes. What was that, Diane? Wonderful. Why is it flexible? It's a great question. Um, part of the reason that it's flexible is at some point these bones have to move. When we're trying to uh, move out of the birth canal, we're going to want to be able to move these skull bones around. And that's why babies come out and they have a cone. <laughs> because they've been moving around because you're trying to force the bowling ball through the straw. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, too, is yeah, we don't want them to move all that much, but. Have you ever seen a car accident with a car that's really, really rigid? I'll give you an example of a car that's really, really rigid. Smart cars are really, really rigid. Anyone seen a smart car in a car accident? They have done these examples where they've run smart cars into like highway dividers at like 70 miles an hour. They'll put like a cantaloupe on the seat and buckle it in and they put it into a car accident. Now on the outside of the car was actually really good most overall. I mean, right where the impact had happened, it gets all crunched up. But most cars, they have what are called the crumple zones. And so, and this is kind of a composite material, the engine block and everything sort of crumples up and that absorbs a lot of energy. In the smart car, our poor little cantaloupe, 70 miles an hour, you go and open up, open up the door and the cantaloupe's not there anymore. And it's just because the thing just disintegrates. <laughs> so don't drive a smart car is, is sort of uh, message number one. Message number two, yeah, we don't want to bash our heads against the wall or against the concrete, but sometimes it happens. And we want those bones to move just a little bit to absorb a lot of that force so it doesn't get transmitted onto our brain. So is that kind of like a crumple zone? I mean, yeah, it, 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 the spongy bone provides a lot of, of different functions, and, and yeah, part of it could be to um, help to absorb some of that. Now, babies, you know, they have their soft spots, and they actually, gosh, I mean, my, my littlest, Ethan, I was, you know, great parent, a great moment in parenting last night. I had him sitting, sitting on the floor, and I was not paying attention. <laughs> and he like started leaning back and fell and like bam cracked his head right against hardwood floor. And I was like, oh. And he started to cry and I picked him up and like two seconds later he was good to go. If it was me, I probably would have taken a trip to the ER and I might not have made it up. <laughs> <laughs> Their brain or brain, their bones surrounding their brain are even more flexible because of the cartilage in the soft spots that are present. And it's really advantageous because you're probably all going, man, this guy sucks his dad. <laughs> but in all reality, babies bump their heads. <laughs> they just do. I mean, there is almost no way around it. It's part of the growing up process. No matter how careful a parent is, a baby is going to bump their head, and it's a good thing they have a baby's head and not an adult head because they would all be retarded by the time they got to <laughs> By the time they got to 10 years old. 
Yep, see, I mean, so you can also do malicious things like dropping a PlayStation on your brother's head or whacking him with a can of paint. What? <laughs> <laughs> and we had a second Nichols. <laughs> oh my gosh. Does everybody have this bone cells? Let's, we're, I'm, I'm going to, I think I'll, I'll, since we're at a little moment here, um, we'll, we'll make everybody good, going to make an adjustment. Maybe. All right, so bone cells. There are four types of bone cells or cells that we're going to find in bone tissue. Okay, so those four types, we're going to have osteoprogenitor cells. The osteoprogenitor cells, you may refer to them as stem cells or bone specific stem cells. And so these are going to be cells that actually give rise to all the other types of cells. Osteogenic, osteoprogenitor synonyms. Both of them are bone cells. So these will be used to give rise to the other types of cells. Then we have osteoblasts. Now when it comes down to bone physiology, these next three types of bones, you're going to hear a lot about them as we discuss physiological processes. So I'm going to try to give you some tricks to kind of keep these uh, four different, three, really three different types of bones sort of in your mind correctly. So the osteoblast, focus on the B. Osteoblasts are bone builders. So these are going to be cells that form bone. And they're going to aid in the calcification process. Osteoclasts, these are going to be bone dissolvers. So blasts are builders, clasts are dissolvers. So these are bone dissolvers and they will aid in a process known as remodeling or bone remodeling. And then our last bone type is the osteocyte. And just based off of the name and your growing ability to parse terms, you should be able to already identify this as a bone cell. Okay, so this is going to be the main bone cell, and it is going to be purposed to maintain our bone density. Okay, basically to maintain the bone itself. Did you say that the uh, process was for the osteoblast? Is it mineralization? Yeah, it's a bone builder, so calcification, mineralization, um, the positive hydroxyapatite, those would all be synonyms. Okay, just like with all of our other tissues, these bone cells are going to be embedded in a matrix. And that matrix is going to, it's going to include water, just like all of our other matrices. But it will also include collagen and protein carbohydrate compounds. Uh, some protein carbohydrate compounds, glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, and glycoproteins. This whole composition here is going to provide flexibility. Okay. 
We're also going to have inorganic minerals that are present in the matrix. Uh, in this uh, matrix, the most common inorganic molecules or minerals are going to be a mineral called hydroxyapatite. This also is known as calcium carbonate. CaCO3, that may not be right. Don't worry, I won't make you know the chemical name or the chemical formula. Calcium carbonate. And this part of the matrix, the calcium carbonate, provides rigid strength. So flexibility up here from the collagen, the minerals provide that rigid strength in the matrix, and then the cells will be in the matrix, and that makes up this tissue known as osseous tissue. 